What's up scholars? Welcome back to another video. My name is Haley, otherwise known as the Fictional Scholar, and today we are going to be breaking down the storytelling from Hunter x Hunter and especially the Chimera Ant arc. And I tried recording this video before, earlier it is last year, and didn't realize my mic had died, so I had to end up scrapping both parts for that video. It's super, super depressing and sad, but we're doing this again. My mic's fixed all as well so this is the second time I'm recording this video so I don't want to waste any time on getting into it but basically this video is going to be broken down into two main parts setting up for the next video where we really dig into the storytelling of this arc but in this video we're going to be talking about two separate things of building up the protagonist and then building up the antagonist. With the protagonist we're mainly going to be looking at Gon and Kilua and then for the antagonist we're going to be looking at Pito, Poof and Yuppie, and then of course Meruem. So I'm really not going to waste any time. Of course if you haven't seen Hunter x Hunter this is your official spoiler warning because I will be talking about everything. So without further ado let's go right into the video. <laughs> So in building our protagonist, Hunter x Hunter does a wonderful, wonderful thing, and especially with Gon as a character, because Gon has always, while he seems like a very happy-go-lucky kid, and he's very positive and bright and fun to be around, his morality has always been more ambiguous than what people normally think. So Gon's moral ambiguity really starts at pretty much the start of Hunter x Hunter with the Hunter exam, and he we really see that first of it when he willingly uses another hunter examinee to bait Hisoka into killing him while Gon sits and waits for the perfect opportunity to kill his or to take Hisoka's tag basically leaving this other man out for bait and he doesn't really care because his purpose is to get Hisoka's tag so that already kind of shows the the difference in his morals where he seems like he cares for everybody that everybody needs to be protected but at the same time when it when it's not within his goals he will willingly sacrifice anybody to kinda get what he wants and to do what he needs to do and that theme kinda translates through Hunter x Hunter especially with like the Heavens Arena arc with Gon willingly pretty much sacrificing himself just to test out a nin technique because he's learned it for the first time regardless of whether or not that you know he was told no don't do this you're not ready this is dangerous but Gong com goes out and does it completely disregarding what Wing has told him and ends up severely injured because of it but it doesn't matter that you know he got several of his bones broken because he did what he wanted to do and tested out the thing he wanted to test and again, that translates into the Greed Island arc, where he willingly explodes his own arm, his hand, and like gives up his arm just to fight against the bomber because he wants to do it. He completely disregards what Bisky and Kilua said. It's like, sorry, but I'm going to do what I want anyways, regardless of how messed up I get. So it really, like, Gon's morality even affects himself because he doesn't really care what happens to him either if he has a goal in mind, if he has something he wants to do, he's going to do it regardless of who gets hurt, even if it's himself. So that moral ambiguity really sets up for the Chimera Ant arc with the whole kite situation and him wanting to get stronger and him traveling with Kite and then after Kite is killed by Pito, like, you really see this moral ambiguity of Gons just go like completely out of control and it starts to fade into more of a he's gonna do what he wants regardless of the consequences and that goes for himself the people around him and basically pretty much what it's gonna do to his life and I love that Gon as a protagonist he is set up to be like the typical like happy-go-lucky protagonist like that's the trope he kind of falls into at first but there's just enough breadcrumbs left throughout the arcs that shows you that he's not the typical protagonist that you usually see in shonen's like these that he is much more 
He's a much darker character than a lot of people tend to give him credit for because of this happy persona that he has. And I love that Hunter x Hunter also does something different where the protagonists don't always win. We see Gon losing a lot in this show, like especially in the Heavens Arena arc, we see him losing to uh, Guido and, and then he loses to Hisoka and he takes a few losses in like Greed Island and even even with the Phantom Troop he takes a few losses but then all these like little losses kind of build up into the Chimera Ant arc when he gets so frustrated losing to Knuckle because he's not strong enough to beat him even though he's doing everything he can he's trying his best but it's still not enough and I like that Hunter x Hunter isn't afraid to make the protagonist lose because we're so used to seeing our main protagonist winning him losing affects his mentality that much more because he so desperately wants to get back into the fight to help Kite and he, that desperation plays a major role when he does end up getting back into the fight and faces off with Pito. Now the other main character that we're really going to be talking about, our main protagonist, is Kilua, of course. Kilua is a personal favorite of mine. I absolutely adore his character development and just how much he changes throughout the course of Hunter x Hunter. And he, his morality, it's more of a found morality with Kilua because he starts off as an assassin and, you know, he, he doesn't really know like what's... I, I should... I could say that he doesn't know what's right and what's wrong but it's more of he's questioning things, he wants to learn about these things and doesn't really know why he's doing the things he's doing but he knows he wants to stop being an assassin. So Kiowa's journey mainly consists of him just growing more in like his mentality and his emotions and finding his morals and sticking to them as he goes which is why at the very beginning you know he sticks to Gone like glue pretty much because he sees Gone as this source of light and he's like, oh, I, I want something like that in my life because his life has been really dark and depressing so far because of his family. And for Kiloa, like, with each arc that goes by, like, he's always been a very smart character. He thinks things through almost to a fault. But his biggest thing is that he always runs away or when he's like, no, I can't win, he dips. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing, him overcoming that obstacle and literally like in the Chimera Antarch when he pulls out the needle that Illumi had planted in him, he realizes that this fear was literally implanted in him and it wasn't necessarily what he had truly felt to the bottom of his heart. And that gives him this sort of liberation and this freedom and the sense that he now truly 100% understands who he is as a person, as a character, and his morality is that he will never abandon his friends, and he's always wanted to live up to that. He's always wanted to protect the ones that he cares about and the ones he loves, but because of that limitation pretty much set by Illumi and his family he felt like he couldn't do that and it was literally tearing him apart on the inside but when but once that is done he's like oh I'm a hundred like I'm fully awake now and he's fully in control of himself and his body and his mind and it's such a cool moment for Kilua this morality that he gains throughout the course of Hunter x Hunter of really caring for the ones around him and really making good judgment calls on people and like really being able to judge people accordingly leads to this wonderful friendship not just between Kilua and Gon but this new friendship that Kilua finds in Ikalgo a chimera ant who is supposed to be his enemy and Kilua consciously makes the choice to save his enemy just because he's like, oh, if, if this were different circumstances, we could have been friends. And he saves Ikalgo's life, which in turn ends up having Ikalgo saving Kilua's life. But I don't think Kilua would have made that choice in the Chimera Ant arc had it not been for everything else leading up to it, all the different changes that he's had throughout the course of the show up to that moment. I don't think if if Kilowatt was put in that situation at the very beginning of the show in like the Hunter exam arc, 
I think he probably would have just let that person die. He would have let the Ecolgo person die. But because of all the changes that he's had in this morality that just continues to grow and grow and grow in Kilua, he's able to say no. I recognize that this person could have been a friend if this were a different circumstance, if we weren't on opposing sides. This is the type of person that I would have liked to have a friend and protect. And so he does just that. And that morality transfers when Kilua and Gaunt are facing Pito, and he is able to recognize the situation immediately, not just because like of his morality, but because he's so smart as well. He's able to look at Pito and Komugi and realize, like, no, Pito is protecting Komugi. She's not hurting Komugi. We were the ones who hurt her. She's trying to save this one. We can't interfere on her trying to save Komugi's life like that would be inhumane on us but he also realizes because of where Gon's at and his morality and his dilemma he's like I can't tell Gon this information so it's like this internal struggle that Kilo is having of how does he go about this situation where he's kind of in a way trying to save Komugi's life but in the same way he's saving Pito's life at that moment because he doesn't want Pito to be killed so Komugi doesn't die. And they do such a great job with Kilua's character and his development and, and they really make him more than just the typical uh, overpowered side character trope, you know, because that's initially what he falls into. He's very powerful, very confident in his ability and we see several times that Kilua gets humbled throughout the series by no he's not the most powerful oh there are other people stronger than him he has a few losses under his belt too like there are times that he's lost and where his overconfidence has came back to bite him in the butt like in the hunter exam where he ended up facing off with Illumi in that whole situation so I really like how the way they create Kilua's character breaks him from that overpowered trope because yes we know that he's incredibly strong we know he's overpowered in a sense but we also know that he has his limitations and there's things that he can't do and when we see him like go off and pop off against an enemy we like get even more excited because we've seen the growth we've seen how he's gotten to that point and it makes us so much more excited to see him fight. I really like that about Kilua is that he struggles just as much and as maybe even more so than Gon does. Not just physically and in, in a fight but this power and manipulation dynamic that's always been in his brain because of his family. The power that his family has had over him without him even knowing because of Illumi's needle and like this manipulation he faces from his family constantly especially it's more of his mother and then especially with Illumi. Illumi is very manipulative and very controlling of Kilua. Kilua has been battling this pretty much his whole life and to see him kind of break free of this power and manipulation and really try start to become his own person rather than just a Zoldic that's under the control of the Zoldic family. Seeing him become his own person and truly make his own decisions of his own free will is such an incredible thing to see because we discover along the way who Kilua is as a person just as he's discovering who he is as a person and it makes his decision have that much more of an impact and weigh that much heavier because we know the toils that he's gone through. We understand like his brain, like his thought process and everything that he's done up until this point to be able to consciously make these decisions. And to me personally, that just makes me respect Kilua as a character even more. And Hunter Hunter really builds up that arc for Kilua so that when it gets to the Chimera Ant arc and you know, we see Kilua be free finally from these needles and everything and makes his impact and his decisions from that moment on in the arc that much more impactful and it really changes the course of the arc at some points. Now with building up our protagonist, of course we can't have a complete storytelling breakdown without looking at the antagonist and how the antagonists are built up in this arc. Now of course for the Chimera Ants arc you of course have just the regular Chimera Ants where there's already like a sense of terror and dread instilled in them just because of all the massacres 
that we see them committing on these women, these children, father, like everybody is at the mercy of the Chimera ants. There's nobody safe with them. But it gets even more daunting when we are introduced to Pito. Now, Pito is the first royal guard that is born for, for the king. And it really instantly shows the incredible power difference between a regular chimera ant and then the royal guard. And it creates this fear because the hunters are already struggling just with the regular chimera ants. Like it's already a problem for them. And then we're introduced to a character that is like a hundred times stronger than them and knows Nin automatically, doesn't have to work for it, doesn't like she is born with Nin with these abilities and is just wanting to grow stronger and test the limits of her abilities pretty much. With that already the power dynamic and the power difference, it's like, oh my goodness, like Pito is terrifyingly strong. But then it begs the question of like if she's this strong, how strong one are the other royal guards going to be? Because there's supposed to be two more. And then two, how strong is this king going to be that's supposed to be stronger than even the royal guards? That dynamic right there already sets off a lot of fear and just a lot of dread. Not just in the viewers, but for the hunters themselves because they don't really know the power scale of what they're up against and it just it doesn't look good for them. It just truly, honestly doesn't look good for them. And Pito the purpose for her one is to show that difference in power and the level of strength between the chimera ants but also pito serves as a purpose to show the true casualties but also how the stakes have changed it's not just that oh well we need to get rid of these before they spread or before you know they do too much damage pito comes in and shows the purpose of no the casualties and these stakes have risen so much this is a dangerous situation to be in and no one is safe and that is proved when pito kills kite pito has no idea who kite is she doesn't know anything about his relationship with gone or kilo she doesn't care about that at first she just knows she found someone that she can test her test her strength against and she does just that. Of course, her killing Kite sets up a huge movement to the rest of the Chimera Ant arc and sets up for a final battle and confrontation with Gon later on. For Pito, it's to show, like, one, that this arc is unlike any arc we've seen in Hunter x Hunter before this point but two it's like it takes a care it takes characters you know and that you're you're growing attached to and it's just like no they're not safe either they're gone and to make it even crueler we see pito really just toying with kite's body kind of making him into her own personal little puppet just to continue to test her strength and to see like what the limits of her abilities are which is very messed up and very twisted because at that point in time, Pito has none of this humanity about her. It's just all about that strength and all about seeing how strong she is. And that slowly begins to change, of course, throughout the course of the season. And with Pito, it's interesting how like her dynamic changes after they get to the little pa palace in East Gorto where they're staying and when she's you know using her end to protect the king and the king meets komogi all of those events that follow we really see pito as more of this character who really just wants to serve her king and protect the king and it kind of changes because we spend so much time with the antagonist in this arc it kind of changes the way we view them because at first you see pito and you're just like oh my gosh i hate her like she killed kai like she She's a problem, she needs to be gone, like she needs to get killed off. And then the more you're doing this and the more you're like, no, like she's she's a funny, like funny character, like very cat-like. And we really get this kind of sympathy towards her because we see that like she really just earnestly wants the best for the king and will protect the king at whatever cost. And especially when Komogi gets hurt and the king asks for her help we see you know Pito crying but her crying like it's such a thing because she's humbled that the king would ask her to do this for him and she would do anything that the king asked of course but this is 
like an even more special task to her because the king it wasn't an order he just asked her to do this so of course Pito is gonna protect Komogi with her life and she does the, just that which makes this confrontation between Gon and Pito that much more like just high tension and stressful because at that point we're we don't want Gon to go off at Pito it's just like no like please let Pito heal Komogi because we've grown so attached to Komogi at this point and Pito is doing her best to protect Komogi for the sake of the king Hunter Hunter does such a great job at having these protagonists that you hate at first and then it flips the script on you and you're kind of like no like l let them do what they're supposed to do let them do their job don't kill her yet like don't do this yet it creates such a fascinating concept of morality and the whole thing of monster versus like being a monster and being a human like this humanity and monstrosity that is such a huge parallel in this arc and we find that Pito is slowly gaining this humanity the more it goes on and Gon is losing it and especially with the king the king is probably the biggest parallel for Gon like losing his humanity and the king gaining his humanity but Pito has that kind of parallel as well just because of how much she just truly wants to protect Komugi for the sake of the king and she's like no please I will do anything like I she's just straight up begging Gon not to hurt her her end is actually I was not happy like it, it was more of like I felt so bad for Pito at the end because even up until the very end when she's facing Gon and they're fighting when Gon is just destroying her she's just like thank goodness he used this power on me instead of the king like that part just wrecked me because like Pito in her final moments is still thinking about what's best for Meryl and what's best for the king and happy that she's able to protect him and happy that she's able to take a huge threat away from the king even if it results in her death. It's really crazy how Hunter x Hunter really just changes the viewers perspective of the antagonist throughout the course of this arc. And then of course we have Poof and Yuppie. I'm not going to spend as much time on them uh, because they do play a little bit of minor roles in the arc. Well, Poof plays a, a major role more so towards the end of the Chimera Ant arc just because he is a schemer and he wants to mess with everything. But Poof and Yuppie both are other royal guards who are set to protect the king and they will do that no matter what. And Yuppie does this in a very odd sense of way where his main thing is that he's going to protect the king at whatever cost. He's not going to think about it. He doesn't need to think about it. Protecting the king comes first. And his little development is that he begins to think for himself and begins to acknowledge these opponents that are coming after him. He's like, no, I know you're not stronger than me, but I admire you for this tenacity and this will to fight. And you know fighting against me making me think and making me come into my own and being my own person in a sense like he wants to th like thank them and reward them for helping him out in that way even though it was completely unintentional on the hunters part like it was completely unintentional to do that they were just trying to do what they were supposed to do Yuppie is able to come to it like a sort of an understanding and respect for humans because of the way that they fought against him. That respect ends up having Yuppie be like, no, I know y'all can't win against me, but I'm not gonna kill you. I'm gonna let you go because of what you've done for me and this respect I have for you. Live your life. At the beginning of the arc, we would have never expected that from Yuppie. It is so crazy how much change that each character is going through, even our antagonist. Like, everybody is constantly changing and developing and growing, and Yuppie does that so incredibly much in such a short amount of time. And it makes a huge impact and changes the course of the Chimera Ant arc because we would have lost a lot of members had Yuppie not made that decision. Now with Poof, he is so dedicated for the king, all he thinks about is what he thinks is best for the king and what what he can do to protect the king. 
poof is different in the sense of where like Yupi is more of a whatever you decide that's what I'll follow for Marowom and Pito is more of the sense of whatever you think is best is what you should decide what to do and I will follow you you know kind of the same thing but poof on the other hand is a little different uh, in the sense of like well I think this is best for you to do as king this is my ideals of what the king should be so he tries to push those ideals on the king in a sense while still thinking that he's doing the what he believes is truly best for Marowam and for you know the chimera ant species as a whole even though it's kind of twisted and messed up he's still doing what he believes is in the best interest of the king of course that leads poof to meddling with the hunters and he ends up meddling with Marowam as well he's trying to hide truth from Marowam he's trying to hide truth from the hunters and he's playing both sides and trying to just scheme and plot and use people as he wants just to get the outcome that he desires because he thinks that's what's best now I don't agree with him Poof's not exactly my favorite character of this arc but I still do acknowledge and admire his dedication towards the king because he truly believed that killing Komogi was the best for the king and he he was dead set like full dedication towards that up until his last moment so I can't really I, I, I won't drag him too much for that dedication and his loyalty because at the end of it all three royal guards were loyal to the king until death and that was like their main purpose is that they were loyal to him and they were trying to protect him up until their last moments now Marilyn is oh my gosh Marilyn is one of the best antagonist villains that I have seen in any show ever he is such a fantastic character he starts off as you know this overbearing overpowered just brute of a dictator king and is killing people left and right even his own kind like he decapitates a few chimera ants like right after he's born at first when we see Marum, it's just this overarching fear that oh my gosh this guy is impossible to defeat like how are they gonna kill him how are they gonna defeat him and it progresses where Marum starts off as just this inhumane monster just complete monster does what he wants only wants to feed on people pretty much and make himself ruler of the world great goals and then of course he's introduced to Komogi I've already made a video about Marom and Komogi the link will be in the description but Marom and Komogi's relationship their dynamic it really changes the king completely and he starts listening better he starts viewing the world better he starts learning that there's different kinds of strengths and there's different types of power in, in this world that it's not just about brute strength or what he can rule over and Komogi slowly starts to change Marum's opinions on humans in general and he he starts to care for her on a very deep level and because of this meeting with Marum and Komogi the entire arc's outcome changes because if Marowam had stayed this dictator king he would have decapitated Netero and Zeno the moment they appeared in the castle to kill him it would not I don't believe it would have been a competition at that point point. and then you know because of the bomb in Netero's heart everything would have exploded and they all would have died and the story arc ends that's that However, <laughs> because Marum had been changed by Komogi to the point where he's not only going to protect her when they're attacked, but he's asking her to be revived and he's taking care of her, showing her this such like tender like love and care pretty much that, you know, he and he's just like, no, we're not going to fight here. A different location will probably suit both of us better. It just blows my mind because 
at a time where he could have easily gone off the rails with anger, he is so calm and collected and been like, no, I'm not going to endanger Kamugi. Let's go fight somewhere else. Alrighty, just that character change is so incredible. And then, of course, you know, his fight with Netero is really iconic and it's so cool to watch. And all he wants to do is learn his name. He wants to know who he is. And that's such a big thing for Meron because he was born king, but the more he, you know, is talking to Kamugi and everything, he realizes that king's a title and he doesn't really know who he is. And this whole self-discovery of who he is and who he wants to be comes from Komugi and this morality that he's slowly beginning to kind of like chip into and kind of see, which we see the first big change in his conversation with Netro and he's like, no, I realize that humans are valuable. He hasn't quite got it because he's like, yeah, I'll set y'all up a little nice place and, you know, y'all can live over there and we'll only take like a few of y'all. <laughs> Okay, so my uh, SIM card got full so it cut off recording. <laughs> I cannot film this one video without some sort of technical difficulty. My mic's still on so there, there's that. So we're, we're gonna try this again. But Merrill's like kind of found morality and him becoming more human progresses like especially after he learns his name from Netro. Of course, you know, the whole explosion happens and he comes back after that. But he knows his name but he's lost his memories. And, of course, you know, after he finds his memories again, especially with Komugi, and they have that ending with both of them, it breaks my heart every time. I cry every time. That really shows, like, how much he's changed throughout the course, the course of the arc. And by the time, you know, Meruem is nearing the end of his life, nobody wants him to die. Like... Everybody wants him and Komugi to stay together and be happy. And it just grows to show like because that's how much he has changed and how Komugi has changed him. And him as an antagonist, he goes from this horrifyingly scary like dictator, overpowered king who nobody can possibly hope to defeat to this character and while he's still overpowered he is kinder, smarter, more human than our main character at that point is. And he's merciful. He's giving compliments to people. He is saying that he wasn't worthy of the loyalty of the royal guard. And all he wants to do is be with Komugi and spend his last moments with her. Like, nobody could have predicted that outcome at the beginning of the Chimera Ant arc when he was born. It's just, it's mind-boggling. And I love his arc so much. It is probably one of the best villain arcs I've ever seen written in anime. But Hunter x Hunter does a really good thing, both setting up and building up these protagonists and antagonists, some to become foils of one another, like Gon and Meruem, and others to just show like how people change, like Pito changed through the course of the arc, Kiloa definitely changed through the course of the arc, and it really gives so much dynamic to the Chimera Ant arc, and nothing is just simply black and white, like there's so much complexity and there's so many layers and complexities to this arc and these characters that it makes the events of the arc that much more compelling and the storytelling plays into these characters that much more and really just highlights these um, aspects of the characters and how building up like from or for our main characters like Gon and Killua's journey like up into this point builds up this you know, persona for them and it completely shatters our expectations for our protagonists and for these antagonists it builds them up and builds them up and then completely shatters and subverts our expectations for them as well. The arc does it so masterfully because of how well the storytelling is done and we'll get to that in the part two of this video but for now that is all we are going to talk about just these characters Gon and Killua and then of course our Chimera Ants, the Royal Guards and Meruem. Now in part two we're really just going to be breaking down the storytelling of the arc 
and really looking at how each little part of this arc really built up to how it ended so beautifully and how it ended the way it ended. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure you like and leave a comment down below. Subscribe to my channel so you don't miss part two. I also have a lot of other videos on this channel that you might enjoy. Make sure you follow on all my social media if you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing throughout the week. So make sure you're looking forward to part two and I will see you next time, scholars.